Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Chronicles of Hollywood History, Past, Present, and Future. Welcome, and here now, Corey Gomez. Hello everyone and welcome to Chronicles of Hollywood History, Past, Present, and Future. Today I am joined by the star, one of the stars of Children of the Corn, Return of the Living Dead 2, North Shore, Point Break, a lot of surfing stuff. I am here with Mr. John Philbin. How are you today? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. Do you surf? I do surf and I keep surfing. I had to ask because, you know, there's about eight surfing films you've been in, so it's like, this guy has to surf. There's no way yeah. he can cast in these movies if he can't surf. Yeah, I was a surfer before I was an actor, and then a, a movie came along that had surfing in it, and I just did everything I could to get in it. And after that, you know, after I worked on that movie, I was fortunate. And I don't know if it was because I was in that movie. That movie, North Shore, became kind of a cult classic, and I ended up getting cast in other movies that had surfing in it, like Point Break. And then after that, I, I got to be in a couple more just because I was a, a surfer who could also act or an actor who could also surf. And then uh, eventually I just stopped working as an actor and started just teaching surfing for like 15 years. And because I kept teaching surfing, I was teaching surfing to actors and for movies and stuff. Then I ended up getting starting to work again as an actor just because I was teaching surfing to people in the entertainment industry. So it's really been an interesting ride. It's gone full circle. Now I get to work in little movies, you know, as a surfer or just cause, uh, just cause I stuck at it. I stayed alive, I guess. I just stayed alive and sh kept showing up and kind of wheel turned all the way around. How'd you get involved in acting? Well, I was acting in high, I started acting in high school in the drama department, you know, doing plays, and I just loved it so much. And then I went to college, and I wasn't studying acting, I was studying econ at UC Santa Barbara, but I went out for a play, a college play, and I got it, and I was in it, and I loved it so much, I just went, fuck this, I don't want to study econ anymore, I'm going to study acting, I'm going to move to LA, Los Angeles, study acting at USC, and uh, throw my hat in that ring, because that's really what I want to do. So I, I went to USC, bachelor, I got a Bachelor of Fine Arts in the theater department, and I lived in Hollywood, and I just started doing a couple of plays when I got out of college, and a manager guy saw me, and he hooked me up with an agent, and the first movie I got cast in was Children of the Corn and Grand View USA, and I just had a pretty good... You know, it was in the 80s. It was like 1983, 84, and I was a young, you know, white male. There were a lot of parts for guys like me back then, so I got kind of lucky, and I was kind of had a, a, a nice little run at it for about 15 years. I had a really good, a good time, and I just got lucky and got into a couple movies that have had legs that have stayed, you know, people still like. Sure, the corn actually they just announced the remake would be rated r for blood and violence which i mean that's kind of a given anyway um that's all good what did you think of all the uh because people laugh at me like i think children of the corn i liked it a lot when i was a kid i it, it didn't hold up as well for me as an adult i really right. liked i think it was like three or four where the guy had the the little kid had the cursed corn and he turned the inner city gang into uh uh, Jesuit corn people. I don't know why I like that one. Did you uh, Did you like the sequels, or did you even bother watching them? I have not bothered watching any sequels of any movies I'm not in, except one. I watched the remake of Point Break, and it was the worst movie I'd oh, ever seen. It was awful. I the mean, worst, and I was just going, "God, these idiots just ruined it." So, yeah, no, I don't. I don't go to sequels. I'm not. I'm not invited to be in. <laughs> I bet. Uh, you're know, usually dead by the end of all the movies I'm in. I think I'm killed off in most of them. Yeah, you uh, you were definitely killed in one of my favorites, um, where well, albino James Spader tried to rape Aunt Becky. Um, I'm talking about the new kids. And that is one of my uh, favorite '80s. I don't know if I call it a horror movie, but definitely a how about we say a stalker crime film. And you yeah, that's a better. You were one of Spader's gang, right? I was. I played. I played Gideon. I was in Jimmy Spader's gang, and and uh, really, you know, was proud to be in his gang. I, and uh, I was, in, you know, intimidated, and I respected him greatly. It was so super fun to work with him. But yeah, we had fun. We were in 
Florida, the whole gang, Eric Stoltz and Lori Laughlin. We had so much fun, Shannon Presley, Presby, and God, it was just a great time. We were there from the very beginning to the very end, just just driving trucks and shooting guns, playing with dogs, raping girls. It was awesome. The only guy who wasn't beginning then was Tom Atkins. They had to kill him off after the opening scene, so, you know. that's a... Yeah. But that was okay. Yeah. No, I love the film, and that was uh, uh, Sean Cunningham, Friday the 13th fame, did that one, I remember. It kind of got overlooked this time. It's kind of developed more of a cult following now, which is rightfully so. Maybe. I haven't seen that. That's a movie. How do you see that movie? I mean, do you have a VHS of it or something? Oh, I've got a collector edition Blu-ray. Well, you got a, oh, my got God. A, I got a Blu-ray edition about uh, actually uh, just earlier this year, the very beginning of uh, 2020. That is the kind of 80s movie I would love to see again. I probably haven't seen that in 30 years or something, maybe more. I mean, since since it came out, that was a lot of fun. I'd love to see that again. It holds up. I mean, it holds up perfectly. And I, my wife had never seen it, and she's like, oh, my God, that's Aunt Becky. And then she's like, oh, my, is that James Spader with white hair? And I'm like, yeah. You know, like, yeah. It was, it was, it's just, I don't want to say it's a fun movie because – it is a fun. fun. It is a fun movie. I mean, why why sugarcoat it? It's a good movie. Yeah, that's fun. Love it. And, and James Spader gets stopped. He gets beat up. He doesn't get the rape and done. So you know, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. It's Jimmy comes out of it okay. Villain. He was Justin. very very good in that. He's such a good actor. That guy just really talk about a guy that went on to have an incredible career. Yeah, you know, it's fun to do. You do these little movies with people, and you know they're. They're just starting their careers. Eric Stoltz as well. And they just, it's just fun to watch, watch him go on and do amazing work, you know, in the big time. So, yeah, Jimmy's an amazing actor. Now, what I have in my office on a giant mannequin head is a big bust of the Tar Man from ah. The Return of the Living Dead. The best zombie movie ever. And the best. The, and it's one of the few movies that you're ever going to see at least back in the time, see, like, I think what hit me double was not only was I a horror fan and a zombie fan, I was a punker. And punkers weren't in movies that often, you know, just once in a while. So here's the whole gang of punks. You know, I mean, you get eaten, of course. But uh, I, 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 how much fun was it to make that movie? You guys look like uh -oh. you're having a blast in it. Well, I think it looks like we're having more fun than we are because, God, Dan O'Bannon, I mean, he wrote... And he directed this, he had a vision for this comedy zombie movie. But none of us really had, you know, you don't, when you read something that's original, you're not really sure what to do with it. it, there, it you know, the genre had not been invented, I'll put it that way. Now you watch all these comedy zombie movies, you know, zombies have taken over and there's a lot of comedy zombie movies. And, you know, you have an idea, well, is this a comedy or is it serious? So we were all just kind of playing it straight, like, well, you know, we didn't know what, to expect so we're just playing our characters playing our characters talking to the other people in character you know relating to what was happening in character and then it turned and then the, he put this wild punk rock soundtrack in it and he just fucking rocketed that movie into another dimension and i really really enjoyed watching it when i was making it we're all just you know we're actors we show up on the set we shoot like a couple scenes of course watching linnea quick dance and the tombstone is gonna i'll never forget it as long as i live it's one of the greatest yeah. nights ever but right after that you know it starts raining so we do the rest of the movie having just run through the rain so basically as an actor what that means is you show up on the set put your wardrobe on and you go stand out in line and a pa just hoses you down with a hose says okay they're dripping wet that you can go to work now and that's how you know that's how you shoot a nighttime raining zombie movie you just get hosed down every night so it's probably more fun to watch than it was to make but god we love watching it now I mean, we've become really great friends we we go to these screenings you know as a cast reunion thing and we get to talk to the fans you know who are second third generation fans now who just appreciate the originality of that vision that dan obana had and now we're all really really good friends we're like a family and i'm really grateful that i was in that got to be in that movie I have Return of the Living Dead sweatpants. You do? I do. That's good. Congratulations. Those yeah. are, I'm sure those are cool. They have the Tar Man on the right leg. He takes up the whole leg. So yeah, that Tar Man zombie was so awesome. Yeah, that guy, total, an amazing 
physical actor, you know, and a, he's a puppeteer too, but he just had a hell job. And it turned out to be this thing he's so famous for, but he had to sit around in that costume for like eight hours, just yeah. sitting in, in this wet, you know, it seemed wet. I'm sure it was wet from his sweat. People didn't even know if he was human or what the hell was going on. He would just sit immobile until he had to work. And then the way he moved was like nothing like anybody had ever seen. So we were so impressed with him, Tar Man. He was so scary. He did such a good job. I'm actually uh, tomorrow going to talk to one of the other cast members from it, uh, Mr. Uh, Tom Matthews. Gotta love Tommy Matthews, man. He, I love that guy. He was one of the guys that I knew, you know, that, I, that I've known, you know, when we made that movie. I knew him and I've known him since. You know, we, we're, we were friends apart from the movie, you know, and so we, get, we had a connection there. So when I would initially go to these, you know, reunions, I knew Tommy. You know, but I then I got to know the rest of the cast just from just from flying on airplanes, staying in hotels, and they're just lovely people. And it's just we've really had a good time with that movie. You never know what a movie's going to do. No, and you know, I remember when it came out; it was, I mean, it was popular. And yeah, just it seems like every year it gets just new legions of fans. I mean, it's legions of fans now. It's a, it's beloved. Yeah, it is. It's grown. It's grown over the years. It's grown a lot in the last ten years, and then. It just blew up like 30 years, you know, it's crazy. It's weird how that happens, and I love it. It's such an interesting interesting thing when fans pick up on original ideas, you know, and make a movie, a cult movie, through their support. It's really cool. When it hits, because, like you said, the soundtrack's awesome. It's got the punk New Wave soundtrack. The score for it was amazing, and the uh, the makeup work, all the effects, It some of the movies, you know, you go back and you watch, and they don't hold up as well, or they look cheap. That looks like it could be made today. You know, it's held up perfectly over the years. Now, those are really, we're really young art department guys, you know, just, you know, who went on to have good careers, but they just, they, it was a super low budget movie with a great, you know, producer and a great, you know, director and writer. So they got some really great talent, you know, young talent to do, to work on that. And it was at a time before computers, obviously. And so everything had to be practical and, they were just original thinkers, and they just came up with some great techniques that really, really just worked so well. That's kind of movie that still works. It's still fun to watch, which is really unusual these days. And it's so much, uh, yeah, it's great. North Shore is obviously one that you're very proud of because you all the surfing in it. Yeah, I mean, I'm a surfer, and you know, I got to play a surfer who gets to surf Pipeline, which is the greatest wave in the world on the North Shore, which is. Like probably my favorite second home in the world with a bunch of and if you're a surfer it's a small community you know so the guys they they went over there and cast all these really famous surfers in the surfing world so these little actors got to go over there and just be starstruck by the athletes that they were working with so yeah that that's a, that's a dream cup true movie for me you know and, it, and and that's another example of a movie that you know low budget movie that just didn't do well when it came out, but 30 years later became a two, three generation cultural cult, cult hit phenomenon that has continued to inform my life. As strange as that may sound, I've been, you know, that, that movie's really helped, you know, it's really been with me, you know, it, more now than it ever has been. It's crazy. Now tell me about the movie I'm sure no one asks about, 1987's Undercover. Undercover. My John Stockwell's first directing debut was Undercover. John Stockwell was in Top Gun, and I'm like, "Wow, you're John Stockwell. That's so cool. You're directing already." He's just a super young guy, and he and you know he gets to do this detective movie with, and he gets Jennifer Jason Lee and my good friend David Nidorf to be in it. And I think David Nidorf, who plays the lead, you know, was an up and coming. Lee man, he was in Platoon, you know, and he was great in it. He was in Hoosiers, and he was just amazing in Hoosiers. And so, you know, and he was in this Steven Spielberg movie about, I don't know, Japan, I don't know, I don't know, with Ben Stiller or something, it was really some great Spielberg movie. So he's, he's only in these big hit movies, and so he gets to be the lead in this, you know, John Stockwell's first kind of a low-budget movie, but it gets to play opposite Jennifer Jason Lee, and I think he got me this part to play his friend, 
you know, and I'm just like so happy to have this little part. I'm just clowning around. You know, I love these little parts where you just kind of clown around and have fun. There's no pressure, you know, but it was really fun. I got to meet Jennifer and, and be friends with John Stockwell. John Stockwell then went on to, you know, hire me as the surf instructor for Kate Bosworth when he directed Blue Crush. And then he cast me in a TV series about the North Shore called The Break, where I also, again, got to surf pipeline in character as a gangster, drug drug dealer, drug addict, badass. And that that's an experience that no one ever saw. It, it was a TV pilot that didn't go, but it was one of the best filming experiences I've ever had. I mean, a powerful experience, but no one will ever see it. No one's ever seen it. Yeah, but Undercover was cool. You know, it had some other good actors in it, too, but it was really fun for me to work on, that's for sure, because it was easy and fun. David, uh, how do you pronounce it, Nightoff? David Nydorf. Nydorf. He's a good actor, but i got to yeah. say, the comical part for me in this film, uh, which is unintentional, he clearly had some receding hair going in the front, especially in some of these Alamy stock photos I have of the movie, and he had gray chest hair. So I'm not sure why <laughs> I'm watching this film. And at least in the beginning, they cover it. For anyone that hasn't seen it, um, he's, he goes undercover in like this smaller town. And in the beginning, he's at least smart enough. He's like shaves his chest because I'm like, okay, that makes sense. There's no 17-year-old kid with, with gray chest hair. But like if you look at the stock photos, he's losing his hair in the front of his head. It was like the, the, he should have went undercover as a coach. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, Am I back? Yeah, you're back. You got me? Okay, God, sorry about that. Anyway, oh, yeah, David's in the basement. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. <laughs> no, it was <laughs> good. He's just a little, a li you know, at least in 21 Jump Street, Johnny Depp passed for 17. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was. That's just one of those Hollywood things, you know. You got to suspend your disbelief. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't very realistic, but it added to the charm to it. Yeah, exactly. And thank you. It adds to that '80s charm when we're just making these '80s movies. And the uh, the cover in um, in the UK is so good because it's like the first, the top half of of, uh, of David is painted. <laughs> like with this varsity jacket and he's got a math book and everything and it's like he's going back to school and then the bottom half of him is like in street clothes reaching for a gun it's like as a cop so it's like one of the coolest VHS covers you're ever going to see oh I got it I hope he gets to see that at some point that'd be great yeah we became really good friends we're still friends today that's another example there are a bunch of us just kind of Hollywood you know around the same age we got to be in movies together and stayed friends. It was kind of it was a it was a golden era. It was really fun for us. What was it like working with Randy Quaid? Had he uh, had he gone full Randy Quaid yet when you uh, no. when you worked with him, or was he still pretty just a normal guy? Just a normal guy, so cool and funny. Just a, he told, hadn't done. I mean, I I really didn't follow what happened to him. I know something kind of maybe he got weird, but he was he was just a totally normal, funny, straight. I was such a fan of Randy Quaid's, you know, because I would see him in theater. You know, his brother was just coming up then at that way back then. And uh, I and Randy was the man as far as I was concerned. So I was just a huge fan. He'd work with Jack Nicholson, you know, and he, I'd seen him in theater, True West. And he was just awesome. He saved the world in Independence Day. There you go. I mean, I've always kind of wondered, too, when you read about people like it's like, oh, no, so-and-so's gone crazy. It's like, have they gone crazy or are they just getting a lot of publicity? You know, I, I've always kind of questioned that, too. So, but Yeah, I don't know. I think that I don't, I mean, I yeah, you hear no publicity is bad publicity, but I think, like, if you're Robert Downey Jr. and you're, you're caught breaking into someone's house and sleeping in yeah, some other little kid's bed, and then you're in county jail. That cannot be good publicity. No. Well, you know, when you mentioned if there if there ever was a feel good story, that's a guy right there that uh, went from that getting clean and become an Iron Man. I mean that that's a that's an American dream story right there. Yeah, I mean that is just the quintessential American dream story. You know, he's got such a good story, and maybe someday they'll make a movie about him. It, 
and he could even play himself. I wonder, yeah, with the new technology. Yeah, it's now then you were in, of course, one of the most famous movies ever, Point Break. Swayze, <laughs> Reeves, my man, speaking of crazy, man, I love Mr. Gary Busey, Lori Petty, uh, John, I mean, everybody was in it. I mean, how, and, and now you're not only in this big budget action movie, you're, you're surf, you're surfing. I know. It's like lightning struck twice for me. When I got that movie, I'm like, wow, lightning has struck twice. I get to play a surfer and I get to work with Patrick Swayze, who I had worked before with on Grandview USA, and I just loved him, and he's just the greatest, just the most generous, sweetest, kindest, all-in guy that everybody loved more than anything, and, and uh, you know, he plays my gang leader and my hero, and I'm just uh, totally enamored with him, So, and he loved us, and we loved him back, so that was a really great experience for all of us little president, you know, the, the dead presidents, you know, or we're not really dead presidents, but we're all presidents you know robin banks and surfing and we got to go to the north shore and surf again and work with all of those same great watermen and do just just more amazing stunt work and then you get to meet a guy like keanu reeves who's just not a normal person he's just really smart and really cool and it's, i love seeing what's happened with his career that couldn't have happened to a better cooler more interesting guy and i'm just so happy i was lucky to be a part of that that's for sure no, and you know, uh, you got to work with uh, Anthony Kiedis too. Did did you get to meet him on set, or was he just there for a little bit? I got to meet him off set. I never got to work with him in a scene or anything, but I got like we went to some shows together at night, you know, and so I got to see him. I see him more now than I did back then. He, he lives up in the neighborhood, and his kids surf, and he surfs, and I teach surfing up in Malibu, so. I see him more now than I did back then, but I don't know if he remembers that we did a movie together. <laughs> but I remember him because he's Anthony Kiedis. I used to see his band at like yeah. when they used to come here, the Chili Peppers. When they yeah, I used to, me too. When they would come to my town, you know, when I was younger, it was either at like the shit bowling alley bar. Uh, as they got a little bigger, it was at like this old closed down amusement park. And now they don't come here because they're selling out stadiums. So, you know, I, I can always say I got to see them in the early days, you know, three or four times. Me too. That's when I saw them too, growing up in L.A. in the 80s. Yeah, and I was a fan, you know, but I don't go to big stadium shows or anything. But, I mean, that was really cool to see them around town in a little restaurant or a bar or something. That was the best. I was a punk rock kid too. That was fun. Those were great times. Oh, they were. And, and Chili Pepper is one of my favorite bands of all. They will be one of my. And they're another band. They've changed over time, but they've re remained the same, so to speak. You know, I, I'm glad they got all that success. Yeah, me too. I like it when that happens. Well, like you'd mentioned Keanu Reeves, you know, everybody's like, oh, he's the toughest man in the world, John Wick. You know, it's like, well, Gino, he was a tough guy in Point Break. And that was the movie that made him a movie star. I mean, Catherine Bigelow has a pretty good eye. And so she cast him, and it was like, what do you mean? You're casting this, like, you know, Keanu Reeves is not a serious movie star. You know, he can't hold his own against Patrick Swayze. And he did, and she filmed him in a way, and she made, that's how he got speed, and that's how he became a movie star. His performance in Point Break, you know, as a leading man, tough guy surfer, you know, face to face with a, a movie star of Patrick Swayze's caliber, you know, she really knew what she was doing when she cast him. And it's been nothing but great from that point on. How was Busey? He wasn't crazy. He wasn't scary of Busey yet in that movie. I, I'm a fan of Gary Busey's because right. he's done such fucking amazing fan. work. The guy's a talent. Well, I love but, Gary uh, Busey. Yeah, I mean, I loved him. And, you know, he's such a huge talent. But he's a huge personality, too. And um, when we worked with him, he had had a motorcycle accident, and he was in recovery from his motorcycle accident. And he was still, you know, he wasn't, I don't think he was doing drugs or anything like that. He was totally coherent and professional. And, you know, he's opinionated and everything, but it was just an honor to be killed by him. He gets to, you know, I get to be shot by him at the airport. And I'm like, this is cool because Gary Busey's in my favorite surf movie, which is Big Wednesday, mm -hmm. and he plays the masochist. And in Point Break, which is, some people say, one of the one of the better surf Hollywood surf movies ever made, 
Gary Busey, the masochist from Big Wednesday, which is, in my opinion, the best Hollywood surf movie ever made, kills Turtle from North Shore, which is a huge cult Hollywood surf movie, in Point Break, which is probably the, the only other third Hollywood surf movie ever made. That is really my in, inside claim to fame. Was Swayze doing his own surfing in the film? No, I mean, he's, Swayze is an amazing athlete. He can, you know, he could have done his own surfing if he had another two years to train. I mean, surfing is one of the hardest sports to learn. You can't just pick it up and learn it in 10 weeks. I mean, you can learn how to paddle and how to pop up and stuff, but catching your own ways. I mean, we had a great, he had, his double was Matt Archibald. And then the guy that doubled him in Waimea was Derek Dorner, who literally went out, wiped out and body surfed down Waimea Bay. You know, had to do it like six times or something. Ridiculous waterman. He's like the best big wave waterman in the world at the time. And just made a legend out of himself for doing that. But yeah, no, people don't, actors don't get to do their own surfing unless they're really good surfers who've been surfing all their lives. You know, unless they're just playing someone who's just learning, you know, then you get to, then you get to do your own surfing. I talked to Marshall Teague last week, uh, Jimmy from Roadhouse, and I was like, boy, that, because, you know, I always knew Swayze was a dancer, and I was like, that fight you had was good. And he's like, that's because I just told him to hit me hard, and we beat the shit out of each other for that whole thing. So a lot of respect for Patrick Swayze. Yeah, he would go all in, in scenes where he wasn't even in focus, you know, playing football with him. He's like throwing body blocks at 100%. And I'm like, what the? We're not even on camera, man. He's like, you got to make it real. You got to make it real. He was so full on, man. That guy was hardcore. What an athlete. How was Tombstone? How was it? I mean, that was, I would say that was one of the most fun movies I've ever had because I got to, I was in that movie from the table read in the beginning and the and first day of shooting with Kevin Jare and then Kevin Jare, the writer, who was the director, got fired and replaced. We took a little break. They rewrote the script, came back, table read for that, all the way to the last day of shooting, hanging out with that cast in Tucson, Arizona. You know, what a blast. Just riding horses, shooting guns, you know, a lot of days off while because I wasn't in every scene. And just to hang around Sam Elliott, you know, and Bill Paxton, Billy Bob Thornton, Kurt Russell, and Val Kilmer, it was just a blast. I mean, who wouldn't like that? I mean, what a cast, man. Jason Priestley's in it. John Corbett. I mean, I had so much fun. Was Here's here's going to be the question that everyone wants answered. You can answer it. Was that mustache all Kurt Russell, or was there some makeup work in there? Well, I think they might have brushed it, you know, with a brush, but that was Kurt's mustache. He worked on it for a long time. That's a mustache. <laughs> That's a mustache. <laughs> we have plenty of time to grow it. The way his hair looks now is just so cool. It's no. You mentioned um, Jason Prisley. I how was he? I always thought he was one of the most underrated actors. He did a movie called Cold Blooded, and anybody that watches that, that guy should have been in uh, not not just TV. He should have been as big in the movies as as he was in TV. Was he a pretty cool guy to hang out with? He was a super cool guy to hang out with. He's just so cool. I mean, I mean, he was as big a star as you could get, you know, from that 90210. I mean, a, a huge TV star. I remember Kurt was trying to give him some advice because Kurt was a TV star when he was younger, a teen kid, you know, and he said, hey, Jason, you should just save, save all this memorabilia from this thing because you just never know. Just put it in a safe place where you can go back and look at it 30 years, you know, down the line or 40 years down the line because... But, uh, yeah, no, Jason is the, he's just a real guy's guy, you know, super cool dude, you know, just really down to earth and great, you know. But he's also really talented and great looking, and he just has a good attitude and good work ethic. He was just great. He was awesome. He did this movie, and no one's ever watched it. It was with him, Janine Garofalo. I forget the actor's name. He was Otter from Animal House. And he's like a Michael J. Fox produced it. He's like a, a real. He's kind of slow, and he runs numbers for the mob. And one day they just decide to make him a hitman, and he turns out to be good at it. And he's he's so good in it. And it's a movie that if you want the DVD or the Blu-ray, I should say, you got to import it from Germany. It didn't even get a release here in the states except a VHS. And uh, I can never figure out why he didn't go on to. You know that movie should have really shot him into somewhere, but it was just kind of one that kind of came and got buried. 
That's too bad. You got some eclectic taste. Yeah, I mean, it's weird so if a movie doesn't get enough advertising or a big enough distribution deal and enough people don't see it or it doesn't get a good review, they get lost real easily, you know, and there's really great work in them, a lot of them, but hopefully he enjoyed it. I'd love to see that too, but I, I think I'm sure he, that guy's happy. I'm sure he has a good life. He likes to race cars and stuff. Yeah, and I mean, and who didn't watch 90210? I mean, come on, I watched 90210. I'm not ashamed to admit it. I would have been back then, maybe, but you know, I'm not ashamed to admit I watched 90210. Come on. Yeah, and you shouldn't be. It's a culture. It's like watching Seinfeld now. You know, you just take a look at it. There, oh, there it is. I, I saw Happy Days too. I used to watch that when I was little. I'm showing my age here, but yeah, I used to watch Happy Days. It's the Fonz. I, I grew up to, with Happy Days. Yeah, it was great. How was the crew? You got to work with Vigo Mortensen. God, the crew. I love the crew. Yeah, me, I met Vigo in the airport, Miami. We flew over to Bimini and this little tiny island off of Miami. And it was just, a, you know, it was a nightmare. Like, at one point, we came back and there was no electricity in the hotel and there was a shark in the pool. Someone had put a little shark in the pool. It was just this run-down little hotel on this island bimini wasn't swinging back then this is in the 80s and it's just like this little dump and but we go out on these boats and shoot you know donald logue is in that he's really cool and then jeremy sisto is as good an actor as anybody and, but you know he's just an amazing actor so my time there was really fun another small character supporting role i don't have any pressure i, I get to just kind of be jerking around but i'm watching beagle mortensen work and becoming friends with him and watching how serious an actor jeremy sisto is and he really i mean he's on another level he's just so serious he wouldn't allow that movie to be uh, you know tongue-in-cheek like he's just very a very dedicated serious actor and so for me it was great to see those guys and and become and make friends with guys like that and then watch their careers and just go, yeah, that guy's really serious actor. You know, it's a whole different level. But it was fun. We had fun. You know, we we I had fun. <laughs> you had the Killing Jar with Wes Studi. <laughs> I like that movie quite a bit. <laughs> the Killing Jar. You you have done what you said you were going to do. You were going to. You said I'm going to ask you questions no one's ever asked you. Yeah, no one's ever asked me about the Killing Jar. The Killing Jar is great. I'm glad you liked it. Yeah, we it was cool because we were up by Lompoc, where we, we filmed that movie up by Lompoc, and that was kind of cool to be up there. And it was a really, un, you know, this, the guy was in the wine vineyard business, you know, before that got huge, you know, it was, he was growing, it was really growing. And he came from one of, you know, that, it was in that environment and that, that, you know, he had a family that had something to do with that. But yeah, that was cool. You know, we're up in these little hick towns, the killing jar. Jeez. You were, and I at this point I had to look up, which is really weird because believe it or not, Hand on the Bible, I just rewatched a bunch of these a few months ago. You got to do an episode of Wise Guy too in, in the beginning on TV, correct? That is correct. I got to do the only, oh, well, oh, Wise Guy, yeah. I went up to Seattle or Vancouver and shot Wise Guy. That's right, Wise Guy. I thought you were going to say L.A. Law. But yeah, that was a TV episodic that was shot up in Canada, I think. Yeah. Vancouver, yeah. And so I got to be in Wise Guy. I mean, I was, I mean, I wish, I didn't get to work with the, that lead guy that was in it, but I got to do, I, it was really fun to go up there and do it before it got canceled. I got to work with that guy that, had, that uh, had, was trying to save someone on the freeway and the car ran into him and he lost his legs. And he was a great actor and a really cool man. Jim uh, Barnes, Brian, yeah. Brian, I can't pronounce his last name yet. Now, were you, I can't remember, were you in it when it was still Ken Wall, or were you in it? Well, that's the, the thing. End? I didn't get to work with Ken Wall, and I don't think Ken Wall was even in that episode, so he might have already left the show. Is that what happened? I wasn't, yeah, you know, I don't, I, with it that he, much. like, got into, he just decided, I think, you know, I mean, I don't know that he didn't want to do it anymore, and so for that last year, yeah, he didn't, he didn't come back. They wrote him out. Yeah, well. He wasn't in my episode, so that's too bad I would like to have met him. But I had a great, you know, that was fun. I got to work with this beautiful actress, meet that other guy, and just be in another city. It's fun to go to these other cities, you know, and work on these shows. I don't know. It's a good life. Now, you clearly are a, a lover of the surf. What did you think of one of the better, or probably not in your opinion, uh, surf movies? I'm talking about Back to the Beach with Frankie Avalon and Annette Funicello. 
I'm sure you've well, seen I it. Mean, I, there were some old Frankie Avalon. There was a movie called Ride the Wild Surf. It was really one of my favorite surf movies. It still is today. I think Gidget and Ride the Wild Surf are great are great movies. But I don't know about Back to the Beach. I, I'm not sure about it. That but was I don't, the one from the 80s with Lori Laughlin. I don't know. Am I in it? No, I'm, I was asking what you thought. Because, I mean, Frankie Avalon green surfs while playing golf and shaving. I mean, it don't get more. I know, I it don't get more Kahuna than that. Yeah, I didn't. I missed that one. <laughs> All right, you're gonna have to see it, and if you can't find it, let me know, and I'll hook you up. Okay, thank you. My other surf question: Did you see Escape from L.A. with Kurt Russell? Of course, I did. Peter Fonda oh, CG surf scene. What do you think? <laughs> well. I mean, I've watched it again, the computer-generated thing. They're surfing down the Wilshire Corridor of a yeah. tsunami created by a nuclear bomb, and there's Kurt Russell. And they had, you know, a couple surfers sitting around, and I was like, well, okay, they're back to doing green screens, surfers standing on a stationary iron board just with their hands out going, woo! You know, I, I was like, they're doing that now? But, you know, I don't know how you're going to film something like that. You know, the movie is so over the top with special effects, but you know, Kurt Russell's the man. So, and Peter Fonda is, you know, an American icon, legend, hero. So I watched it. I can't say I was like, well, this is probably not their best work, but, uh, Bullshit. Not my that's one of the best work they've done. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, it was, you know, escape from New York. The original is one of the great movies along with the warrior warriors. Oh yeah. These are great movies, and Snake, you know, Kurt's the man. He's been in more movies than anyone, I think, ever, and he's still getting, he's just getting better. That was the first R-rated movie I ever saw, was Escape from New York. Fuck, man. And for my 10th anniversary, or our 10th anniversary, I should say, my wife got me uh, one of the original posters. It's framed in my basement, but... When I was a little kid, I, I think it was probably six, and I was like, I'm going to get a big snake tattooed on my stomach. Well, yeah. I got a big dragon tattooed on my stomach. I didn't go the snake route, but uh, I'd like to think that it's still inspired by Kurt Russell. Yeah, that's good. That's good, man. Snake Pliskin. Yeah, he, I remember watching, I was friends with Kurt because we'd done Tombstone, and I was watching dailies over at his house for Escape from New York, too. I, I was friends with this. I don't know, I was friends with the family. I was over at their house watching some dailies, and there was this scene, and I hadn't, you know, wasn't try I it wasn't in the movie, I hadn't read the script or anything, but I watched Kurt in this scene, and the director's with him, and Kurt goes back and gra grabs this jacket off this guy and, and takes it and runs out, and they were, they were talking to the director about whether they should keep that in. I went, was that your jacket? Did that guy take your jacket? And he's like, yeah. And I go, well, you got to go get it back from him. That's, you know, you're a fucking convict. You got to, you got to take what's yours. Yeah. Somebody fools your shit. You got to fucking take it back from him after <laughs> you kill him. He's like, see, yeah, he gets it. Cause Kurt really wanted that scene in where he goes back and grabs his jacket. And I was like, yeah, you got to get it. Yeah, Kurt. No, I mean, that, you know, people kind of shit on LA because, you know, of all the, I think because all the CG and that, but, it's a fun movie. I saw it in the theater. It's a great movie. I love it. I just watched the Scream Factory disc not that long ago again. Yeah, it's probably fun once you just kind of get accept the CG, all the computer stuff, and say and know that it's not the original, and it's just you know kind of fun. It's a fun movie, probably. A sequel is a fun fun ride. My favorite movies are the Fast and the Furious. I, I don't have to think for two hours when they're on. Yeah, not a, I watch every one of them. That, that I think those were based on a kind of a point uh, based Very, on point oh, break. Heavily based on point break. The whole yeah, concept so is taken they, from there. Yeah, when that came out I was like, Oh, this is point break. That guy's a surfer. I mean that that kid that, that died that's the lead of it was a really good surfer actually, a really cool guy and a really good surfer and then he got that franchise and God damn so sad that he died. But I mean he was really cool, he was really into jujitsu really early on. He was a surfer into jujitsu and he got this job, you know, play the Keanu Reeves part in a, in the driving, you know, the driving film version of Point Break, you know, and Vin Diesel gets to play the other part, and it was really just just works, man. I love that movie, that franchise. I'll see every one of them, make ten of them. I mean, there's there's never, and I don't think when I say there never has been, I go on record and say there never will be a franchise 
where by the time you hit part five, your movies are now making a billion dollars. I mean, it, you don't have a rise to fame like that. It's it's unheard of. Yeah, that was really something. That's something. Uh, Soul Surfer. How was Yay! that? I mean, because that's a nice family movie, even though a girl gets her arm eaten by a shark. Yeah, I mean, it's a true story. Bethany Hamilton is, like, one of my favorite surfers. Got her arm bit off by a shark in Kauai when she's just a young teenage girl and came back and learned how to surf and is now still one of the best surfers in the world. She's out there doing incredible things. What an athlete. So Helen Hunt is in that movie, and I was Helen Hunt's surf instructor, and I worked with her for that movie. And then she threw me a bone and said, hey, we'd like, you know, we're going to Hawaii. Will you come over and teach surfing and, and do this one little line? Like, do one, we'll get you a line in the movie and you can be like a, and I'm like, yes. So I went over to, you know, I taught, I gave Helen a bunch of lessons. I went over to Hawaii and I got a little part in it, but I got to t- take Bethany Hamilton's mom surfing, Cherry, and I got to meet Bethany, who's a fucking legend in our sport, you know, just a legend in our sport. And I just so much respect for Bethany Hamilton and her whole family. I got to hang out with her whole family, surf with her mom and watch her surf up close and work with Helen Hunt and Dennis Quaid. And, uh, yeah, that ended up being probably the most successful surf, financially successful surf movie ever made because of the Christian element in it. Um, that movie made a fortune. I've had a crush on Helen Hunt since girls just want to have fun. I think I was, I don't know, 10 when that came out, maybe younger. I, mean, just, I still yeah, that's like when the, That's when the crushes start. Yeah, it is. No, yeah, Helen, Helen really took to surfing, and, and she, made, she direct, wrote and directed a surf movie that I got to be a producer on called Ride. And um, she, gosh, it's unbelievable that she can direct star and write in a movie i mean that that is a herculean project she's got the energy of 10 people and what she's done everything you know she's done absolutely everything but she fell in love with surfing so she really that's why she did soul surfer so that then she could direct her surf movie which is called ride with luke wilson what did you think of the george clooney gene simmons surf classic red surf that's another one i missed i love george clooney He's but a miss- surf and drug dealer with Doug no Savant, way with Doug Savant. They're drug surf dealers trying to get out of the business ran by Gene Simmons, also oh a God. drug-fueled surfer. Maybe I need to, you know, I don't know. I, I got to watch that, man. I wonder how George feels about that movie. Maybe he feels great. He was coming up in it, but I, I missed it. I heard he did it. I think I guess I saw a, pic, a poster of it once, but I didn't see the movie. George Clooney admits how much he loves the greatest comedy ever made, Return of the Killer Tomatoes. So I'm pretty <laughs> sure he's proud of uh, Red Surf, too. Good. Hey, Matt, Good shit. Doug Savant, Dee Dee Pfeiffer, Surf and Dope for Gene Simmons. You can't go wrong. Yeah, how can you go wrong? That's, a, that's great. I mean, whoever, once that, once that sentence was written, the studio should have said, here's $60 million. Right. How much did they? Was that like a six million dollar budget? What was the budget? Oh, I doubt it was a million. Not even a million. I mean, yeah, because that I was like under a million. That was, under, that was oh. before he even did Facts of Life. I mean, that was the epitome of before he was anyone. Oh man, I definitely didn't see it. Uh, it, you know, it's probably on YouTube. If not, like I said, uh, I think I, have, I think I have the German release of that. A lot of these movies I have to outsource <laughs> from overseas because. I don't, I'm not into the, I don't believe in the bootleg thing and you can't get half the stuff in America. So yeah, I've got to pay like insane amount of money to get stuff imported. Thank God for Germany. Oh, that's how I got my snake eater Blu-rays. Although I got those for free to review them. So, but otherwise, come on, how are you going to watch snake eater on YouTube? No, it needs (laughs) Blu-ray. Now, how'd you meet Branscombe? Oh, I, I mean, I think... He was doing some karate movie or something like I wanted to. They were doing these low budget movies. And I think I want, I just was trying to, I had nothing going on. I wanted to do something, but it never really worked out. So I didn't really get to know him or anything. He just, you know, he's a, he's a martial artist too, you know, Mm -hmm. and yeah, and he's good friends with this friend of mine in Maui. So I just got to meet him. He's just, he's always busy. He's always doing something. He's a cool guy. Oh, he is. He know and he knows everybody. Hey, yeah, that's how I got your phone number. Well, there you go. 
Now, and I've also talked to you for quite some time here in the evening, and I don't want to keep you, but what advice would you have for people wanting to break into the business today? Oh, man, how, I wouldn't possibly have any advice of people wanting to break into the business. I think the business has changed quite a bit. I, I, I mean, I would say, I, I look, I'm 60 years old, so if someone wants to break into the business, I think they should make a little movie and post it online on YouTube. They should make little skits, little short dramatic skits that showcase their talent and their best features. If they're great looking or if they're super funny or if they have a, a flair for horror, they should make little short films and post them on YouTube and online and, 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 you know, on Instagram and wherever people are watch TikTok or whatever. Just make, do a, make yourself, don't wait for someone to go, Hey, I want to, don't hang out at a at a soda shop and wait for an agent to or a studio direct to go like, "Hey, you want to be in my movie?" I think that's what it was like when I was a kid. But yeah, I don't, you know, just make a, a little movie and put it out there. That's my advice. Now, for all your fans out there, you know, you've got uh, legions from Return of the Living Dead alone. Uh, are you online? Do you are you have a website? Do people find you on Twitter? Anything like that? I don't. I'm not on Twitter. I have an Instagram. It's John Philbin. I have an Instagram account. I, you know, it's mostly me riding motorcycles and surfing and stuff. I got some Return of the Living Dead up, stuff up there. Um, I got a pro surf instruction website if someone wants to take a surf lesson from me. Of course, anybody can just Google me, John Philbin, and find me, and then there's a bunch of, you know, articles and links to the different social media things I've participated in or interviews I've done. Maybe this one will be on there. I hope so, because it was fun. You asked a lot of obscure <laughs> questions. That, that was really a trip down memory lane. Thanks for your time. That oh, was fun. No, it was my honor. Is uh, I going to ask, what, uh, I think I know the answer, but I'm going to ask anyway. What film are you the most proud of, if you have one? Oh, I mean, the most proud of? Uh, that would be, I mean, for... I would have to say North Shore because I created a character that struck a chord in a lot of people. So that I did that, you know, it's probably the fifth movie I ever did. I didn't think it was going to be the movie I was most proud of, but as it turns out, it was, I was probably at some of my best, my best work and it definitely got seen by a lot of people and appreciated. So I guess that that's the one. I was going to guess The New Kids, but I was wrong. Oh, I loved The New Kids, though. That was the third movie I ever did. It was, you know, just making friends with Jimmy Spader and Eric Stoltz. Can't go wrong with that. And just having to, having to hug or hold back Lori Laughlin is pretty pretty cool. Because I went to USC. Nice. You know, and I never mentioned in Granby, USA, that we worked with Patrick Swayze the first time. You were in there with Jamie Lee Curtis. I know. How great is she? I got to be, you know, really, like, fall in love with Jamie Lee Curtis during that movie. You know, she was in love with Jamie Lee Curtis. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. I mean, that was really fun for me as a young actor. And Randall Kleiser directed that. And I was, you know, a method actor. So I was in character the whole time. And, uh, when we finished that movie, that's why he, he produced North shore. I think that's why I got the part in North shore because he said I could, I would be able to transform into a different character for the movie North Shore, which I got, he had faith that I could do that. And I'm just grateful for that because that, that movie ended up being, like I said, my, my best work. Now when this COVID is all done and conventions and that ramp up, do you do a lot of the horror conventions? Like I know like uh, Texas Frightmare, a lot of them, they'll do like the return of the living dead reunions and that. Do you go to a lot of I do. I do as many as I can. I'm not like Tommy Matthews who gets to do them all because he's in a Friday the 13th. Well, and he's, yeah, he, hey, he, yeah. He's, he's Jason's, Jason lives, Big, come on. <laughs> exactly, and he's in a game about it, like there's a, a game thing yep. about it, and he's in that too. Yeah, you but I don't have to kill Jason in the game, I play it. <laughs> yeah, there you go, yeah, no, I don't get to do like that, but I go as often as they'll invite me. I like being part of that family, and when they let Chuck and Casey come along, you know, that's really fun. I, I, do a, I, I was doing about four a year or something, that was great, it was really fun. Loved it. I hope we get back to it. Well, I hope we can get back to normal here pretty soon. Yeah, me too. 
Well, I want to thank you again for your time, and I'd love to have you back on again one day. I think there's a lot of other fun things we could talk about. Yeah, you asked the greatest questions. So if the latest movie I did is called Undateable John, and it's available on Amazon Prime. And, it did, you know, it's another super low-budget movie, but I'm this is me now, and it was really fun to work with Tom Arnold, Daryl Hannah, and Estella Warren, and that's what people can see. That's what I'm doing now. I thought it was fun. Tom Arnold. And next time man. I come on, that's what we'll talk about. The Wait. latest, all the latest little movies I've done. Wait a minute. You got to work with Shannon Doherty in that. That's correct. I did. She, I, I worked with all the 90210 people. She, she, I doubt she'll remember. She filmed a movie here when I was 19 years old. And I knew the, the hotel she was at. And I went to this goddamn hotel's bar for six hours a night for like a week and a half straight until she finally came down. It took me forever to get the balls to say hi to her, and, and then I left. But you know, other than that, my plan. Oh, of getting I'm sure a date, she'll remember. My plan of getting a date with her sure fell apart. But uh, yeah, she, oh God, she was gorgeous. <laughs> yeah, beautiful woman, great woman. Yeah, I wish her nothing but the best with all she's going through. Right. And right. Tom Arnold's a man. I love Tom Arnold. Yep. He's my scenes with Tom and Estella mostly, and he is just the fucking rock star. I love that man. He's awesome. Dude, this was so much fun. I want to do it again, so let me know when I can. Thank you for your time, ladies and gentlemen. You have been listening to the Chronicles of Hollywood History. Thank you from Gomez Richmond Productions.